I'm now absolutely delighted to introduce Professor of Epidemiology at the University of College London, Professor Sir Michael Marmot. It's going to say don't clap yet, you don't know what I'm going to say. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here and the idea that Leeds could be a Marmot city. Um, as I've been saying, we need national action on health inequalities, improving society. But when I push on a door and it doesn't open, I don't bang my head against the door. I look for doors that might open. And the doors that are opening and are wel welcoming us in are in cities and regions around the country. I need to introduce it because people's usual default position in thinking about health inequalities, you must be talking about inequalities in access to health care. No, we're not. Inequalities in access to care are extremely important, but we're concerned with the social determinants of health. The opening line of my book, The Health Gap, my book, The Health Gap, <laughs> was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that make them sick. And it's those conditions that we're seeking to address. The three recent challenges to health inequalities, a decade of austerity, as I was saying to Tim, who picked me up from the station, I was listening to a podcast of George Osborne uh, boasting about how he got everything right after 2010. I got a blister while I was walking along listening. I was so angry. He got everything right um, and that everything's gone wrong since the genius who was in charge for those five years is no longer in charge. The COVID pandemic, and I won't say much about that this morning, but just to say two things. First, I've been asked to co-chair a global council on inequality, HIV, and pandemics. UNAIDS has said, we know a lot about control of AIDS. We know a lot about access to care. What we want to do is address inequality in relation to AIDS and pandemics. And as it turns out, related to that, uh, I'm giving evidence to the COVID inquiry on Friday. A member of my family said, did they requisition your WhatsApp messages? Um, don't know quite what they would do with my pictures of my little grandchildren in states of undress. Um, but they're my grandchildren, it's okay. Um, and the question that I'm addressing in module one is, the issue of inequalities. The inequalities were so great that we were ill-prepared for the pandemic. And then the pandemic exposed those inequalities and amplified them. I won't say more about that now. And then the cost of living crisis, which of course, like everything else, increases inequalities. We had the 2010 Marmot Review, commissioned by the government of the day. The, our 2020 review was not commissioned by the government of the day. I don't think they wanted to know, uh, supported by the Health Foundation. We had six domains of recommendations in the 2010 review, which we reinforced in our 2020 review. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, part of what you're doing in Leeds, those first two. And number three, employment and working conditions. Number four, everybody should have at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. Number five, healthy and sustainable places in which to live and work, which includes housing, of course, and environment. And number six, taking a social determinants approach to prevention. 
In the light of COVID, and it should have been there all along, we've added number seven, tackle racism, discrimination, and their consequences. And number eight was really there from the beginning, which is deal with the climate agenda and the inequalities agenda together. Illustrating what Victoria, who's recently been promoted from deputy director to director of public health, um, that's a potential career limiting mistake you just made. <laughs> of what happened, uh, life expectancy had been increasing about one year every four years for women and for men. We've taken it back to 1989. I could take it back to 1900. Life expectancy had been increasing through the whole of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century by about one year every four years. And in 2010, that curve flattened, the rate of increase slowed, and just about ground to a halt. This is when the genius was in charge of the economy. I've been very careful that correlation is not causation. And when we published our 2020 report, we said it was plausible that a decade of austerity led to this slowdown. We, it's not an experiment, difficult to establish causation. Subsequent evidence shows that those local, local authorities that had bigger cuts in funding had slower improvements in health and even declines. And then the pandemic, a 0.9 of a year drop in life expectancy um, for women, for men, something like 1.2 year drop. I said, I'm not gonna talk about the pandemic, but with this new global council, in New York City, in 2020, life expectancy for white people dropped by three years in one year. For African-Americans, it dropped by 5.5 years in one year. And for Hispanics, it dropped by six years in one year. In arguably the richest country in the world that had the best president ever in the history of the universe at the time of managing the pandemic. I'm being ironic. And when we look what happened regionally, and it illustrates what Victoria was saying, in the least deprived 10% of areas, this is women and men, in the least deprived 10% of areas, life expectancy went up. In the most deprived 10% of areas, firstly, much bigger regional variation than in the least deprived. If you're rich, it doesn't much matter where you live. The poorer you are, the more that it matters. The bigger the disadvantage of living in the northeast, northwest, Yorkshire and Humber and the like. And life expectancy went up for the poorest in London, but went down in virtually every other region outside London. So in that decade of austerity, life expectancy stopped improving. The inequalities got bigger. The social gradient and the regional differences got bigger. And life expectancy for the poorest went down. Are you listening? Life expectancy went down. People got sicker. And if you accept the proposition that the health of a society tells us something fundamental about how well that society is doing. Our society was getting worse and more unequal. The government's ambition elected in 2000, and I'm not party political, I just look at the evidence. 
the government's ambition was austerity. They made no secret of that, still boasting about it. In 2010, public expenditure was 42% of, sorry, up there. Public expenditure was 42% of GDP. And over the decade, that came down. It went down to 35% and went up, of course, during the first year of the pandemic. So there were steep cuts, and those cuts were regressive. We coined the phrase in the 2010 report, proportionate universalism. The default position we just heard about Leeds of a quarter of the population living in the most deprived 10% of areas, quarter or more. And it's tempting to focus on the worst off. Kind of makes sense. We looked at Nordic countries where their whole philosophy is universalist programs. A health system for the poor is a poor health system. An education system for the poor is a poor education system. So we were trying to combine these two approaches. Given that health follows the social gradient, the more deprived the area, the worse the health, of levelling up. Good idea. So there's the gradient. Let's say less deprivation, more affluence shorter life expectancy. We want everybody to improve. If we focus only on the worst off, then we miss the health disadvantage. If we focus, say, on the bottom 10%, we miss the health disadvantage of being in the bottom third, but not in the bottom 10%. So we said universalist programs with effort proportionate to need. I mean, that is, after all, what the NHS does. Need there is defined clinically. If you've got diabetes and peripheral vascular disease and eye problems and renal disease and cardiac problems, we spend a lot of money. The need's greater. It's a universal system available to all of us, still just with effort proportionate to need. We say you should provide define need in relation to social need, deprivation, for example. And in fact, as you know well, the more deprived the area post-2010, the steeper the cuts to local authority spending. What we got post-2010 was effort inversely proportionate to need. And the Leeds approach is focusing on the bottom 10%, but as I looked at the Leeds approach for children, I looked hard, but it seems to me that could be described as proportionate universalism uh, of wanting all children in Leeds to thrive, but recognizing the greater the deprivation, the greater the effort that is needed. So I talked about the general context. Um, Amartya Sen, forgive the technical thing of space, but this question of which is more important, relative poverty or absolute poverty? If you look at relative poverty in relation to childhood poverty, less than 60% median income, poverty's been going up. If you define absolute poverty relative to 2010, yeah, poverty's been going down. But why would you take relative to 2010? Um, and Amartya Sen's approach is saying relative poverty with respect to income yields absolute poverty with respect to capabilities. In other words, it's not just what you have that's important, but what you can do with what you have. And what you can do with what you have depends a great deal on the environment. 
I talked about New York a moment ago. If you're an American city, let's say not New York, because it does actually have public transport, but in virtually any other American city, you need to run a motor car. Why would you run a motor car if you're poor? It costs a lot of money. Well, because there's no other way to get about. But if you've got subsidised public transport, individual income matters less. If you've got healthcare free at the point of use, individual income matters less, and so on. Well, if we look at where we were pre-cost of living crisis, this is the percent of household consumption spent on essentials, food, fuel, clothing, and transport by quintiles of um, income. So for the richest, the percent went up a bit between 2006 and 2019. For the poorest, the percent of household income spent on essentials went up a great deal by 2019, before the cost of living crisis hit. So in other words, if you were in the bottom quintile, or the second bottom quintile, or even the third quintile, you were much more sensitive to a rise in prices than if you're in the top quintile, because you spent less of your household consumption on essentials. And that's why we get this phenomenon from the Food Foundation. 6% of people not eaten for a whole day because they couldn't afford food. In the UK, in January 2023, 6% of people report that they had not eaten for a whole day because they couldn't afford to eat. 16% had smaller meals or skip meals. Overall, 22% of households with children had food insecurity. Somewhere between a fifth and a quarter of households with children reported food insecurity. Smaller meals, being hungry but not eaten, or not eaten for a whole day. And if you're disabled, each of the problems is more difficult. Overall spending, um, who've tried to cut back spending, disabled, non-disabled, energy use, clothing and shoes, leisure, every category is worse if you're disabled compared with non-disabled. We used to think that work was the way out of poverty. It was the way out of poverty, not anymore. This is the percent of working age adults living in poverty in households where at least one adult is working in different parts of the country, before housing costs, after housing costs. More than half, it varies a bit by region, but more than half, more like 60% of adults below the poverty line are in households where at least one adult is working. Work is not the way out of poverty. To summarise, the UK is a poor country with a few rich people. We're fond of telling ourselves that we're the fifth or sixth richest planet on the fifth uh, country on the planet. In terms of income per person, we're not the fifth, we're not the sixth, we're the 25th. And when you look at the distribution of income, the poor in the UK are poorer, the bottom 10% are poorer than the poor in Slovenia, 
are poorer than the poor in Poland. Britain is not a very good place to be poor. And when ministers say that nurses are greedy, what? What about people in adult social care who are paid less than a real living wage? Greedy? This is perpetuating being a poor, lowly paid country, being in poverty despite being in work. These are not scroungers, skivers or whatever, not too lazy to work. These are people in work who are below the poverty line whose health is suffering as a result. Let's get this clear. And more people are having resort to citizens' advice. Um, by year, it's going up, and this is 2023, um, because they're desperate. And it varies by ethnic group. Um, in Leeds, whites made 79% of the population, but when you look at people seeking advice, the whites are around 60%. So ethnic minorities are much more likely to be seeking advice. They're more likely to be in trouble. And Leeds is a very diverse city, as you know well. There's Leeds and there's England, and a greater ethnic diversity in Leeds. What did I see? 200 languages spoken in the schools? Wow. Give every child the best start in life. From UNICEF report card 16, international data, looking at outcomes by the number of times children were in poverty between birth and age 14. So the greater the number of times children were in poverty between birth and age 14, the more likely they were to have a low word score on a vocabulary test at age 14. Poverty damages children's ability to speak, let alone do well in education and get a good job. The more they were in poverty, the greater the obesity. The more they're in poverty, the greater the likelihood of depression. People rightly are concerned about the rise in teenagers being depressed, suicidal and the like. Well, yeah, smartphones may have something to do with it, but let's look at poverty as well. Child poverty, income deprivation affecting children. So it's different to the 60% uh, measure. Here's the England average. Here's the Leeds average, worse than the England average. And here are all the local areas that have higher rates of child poverty than the average. School readiness, percent of children achieving a good level of development at age five. There's Leeds, not doing so well, um, below the average, and that will, we know that measure has a strong link with deprivation. The greater the deprivation, the smaller the percent of children age five having a, a good level of development. Average attainment, eight, uh, attainment eight score per pupil, by free school meals eligibility. Leeds is pretty well on average uh, on that measure. And of course, children with eligible for free school meals do worse. In fact, in London, the gap between the kids eligible for free school meals and the average is smaller than the rest of the country. 
um, particularly in East London, in Tower Hamlets, in Hackney. The question is why? I say I don't know, so I can now give you some explanations, having said I don't know. Um, the Bangladeshi community say, we did it, we look after our kids. And indeed, there is evidence that poor Bangladeshi kids do better than poor white kids. The teachers say, we did it, we get out of bed in the morning, telling ourselves poverty is not destiny. The funding people say, we did it. The spending per pupil is higher in London. And another kind of explanation in places like Hackney and Tower Hamlets in East London, there are a lot of poor kids around. And being a poor kid where everybody else is middle class or relatively affluent might be worse for your school performance than to be with other poor kids. So that's four different explanations. That's another way of saying I don't know the answer. But I think it's quite important to try and figure it out. Housing. You know this well. Um, if we look at 2021 and 2011, then there are changes. Um, the decline in social renting, the rise in private renting, and particularly for younger people, the decline in home ownership, uh, which is a national phenomenon, uh, the ambition to be a property owning capitalist society is under real threat. Let me come back to the theme, and this relates to housing, of course. You have to be able to heat your dwelling. And fuel poverty, we produced a report last year, uh, nine months ago, another report on fuel poverty, uh, say that it will kill people. And look at this. If you're in the top 10% of income in France, you spend about 6% of your income on home energy. If you're in the top 10% of income in the UK, you spend about 6% of your household income on energy. If you're in the bottom 10% of income in France, you spend 10% of your income on energy. If you're in the bottom 10% in the UK, you spend 18%. That gap between the rich and the poor in the percent of income spent on energy is bigger than in any other European country. To repeat what I said earlier, Britain is not a good place to be poor. We are a poor country with some rich people. And when the price of energy goes up, these people really suffer. Really suffer. There's no flexibility in the system. And the two big inflationary pressures have been food and energy, which selectively affect people at low income. That's all the bad news. <laughs> and there's a lot of it. But the good news is the way I began, why I'm excited. We more than 40 local authorities uh, one way or another, have been trying to implement Marmot principles and recommendations, analysing, reporting and implementing. And the implementing is a big part of it because we don't just want to describe the problem or analyse it, we want action and we want to see if action's making any difference. We had a one-year follow-up meeting. My colleague, Tammy Boyce, has been very much involved in Cheshire and Merseyside, uh, where they were reviewing what they've done in the year since we produced our Altogether Fairer report 
health equity and the social determinants of health in Cheshire and Merseyside. And there's a great deal of action. I think it's fair to say they're pretty excited with what they've been doing in the years since we produced this report. Uh, Lancashire and Cumbria, similarly, there's a lot of ongoing activity. And all of these places, Coventry was the first, um, Luton, a Marmot town, I, just saying, uh, Luton was a Marmot town before Leeds was, and Luton got promoted to the premiership. And <laughs> correlation is not causation. <laughs> so all of these places um, have taken this on. And implementing. So here's Coventry, which was the first, and they set up a Marmot partnership. Um, and this is the way they go about it. And interestingly, Coventry, which started 2010 after our 2010 review, recently got funded uh, by the National Institutes of Health Research um, to look at what they and others have been doing. And they've got these subgroups on the early years, work and poverty, healthy places and communities, and minority groups. I, I uh, have some dissociation of the use of the word marmot. I just assume it's got nothing to do with me as a person. It's just some brand that people do. And so the Coventry Marmot Steering Group got the police, OHID, all of these actors. And when I've gone to Coventry, the fire and rescue service and the police and the education, they're really enthusiastic about all working together. Coventry told me when they bid to become European City of Culture, they said, our bid was helped by the fact that we're a Marmot city. And I said, oh, come on, you say that to all the boys. No, no, the fact that we're working together across all the different sectors, it made sense that we should be the European city of culture. You won't have noticed this, but um, Keir Starmer, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago now probably, um, unveiled his health mission and they produced a technical document. You had to read to page 12 of the technical document to find the next Labour government will amplify the Marmot cities like Greater Manchester and Coventry by making England a Marmot country, tackling the social inequalities that influence health, ensure that children have the best start possible, a smoke-free Britain, empower people to take responsibility for their own health. Well, I said, we've got to work locally if we can't work centrally, just possibly a different government might take this on. And unusually for, for us, we've done something different. Legal in general approached us and said they want to know if what they do in their day job could improve health and reduce health inequalities. They have 1.3 trillion pounds under investment. If you looked at the price of tomatoes lately and you think, God, maybe I can't buy tomatoes this week, 1.3 trillion pounds under investment. So they're big players and they want to know what they and other business could do to improve health and reduce health inequalities. We produced a report and said three domains, good quality work, pay everybody a real living wage, good working conditions and the like, healthy products and services, and essentially be an anchor institution, have a positive impact on the community and the environment and the like. And we 
they're hoping that Leeds will take this on, that will include business as being part of a Marmot City. In public health, we've always seen business as the enemy. Tobacco, fast foods, poor working conditions and the like. And for good reason. But given that most people in employment, a majority, are in the private sector, how about trying to make the private sector our allies rather than our enemies? And the argument from the businesses we've spoken to is, yes, of course, a healthier and more productive workforce. Staff retention, better recruitment, attracting consumers, attracting investors. And Leeds NHS could be doing this, in fact is doing it. Um, improving access to employment and targeting etc. apprenticeships, having um, being a city uh, a civic partner, having an impact on the environment, and delivering good services for the people who use that service, for the population that is being served. So the same approach that we develop for business can be used in the public sector as well. My friend Tammy gave me a book with this on the cover that's very much influenced me. Raymond Williams said, to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. I think what we're doing here in Leeds is making hope possible in the face of all the pressures of despair. Thank you.